welcome everybody. Um, oh, we just said the poll pop up. Oh, can we see that again? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so uh, nice mix there of uh, foresters, science and academia, business and media, a really good split and other, lots of others. And um, it's also really good to see that um, some of you have read the content on the uh, Otata Nahiri website, but a good deal of you haven't. And uh, so that's exciting for us because yeah, the, if you visit pureadvantage.org, uh, you'll uh, see a, an absolute treasure trove of content there about uh, Nahiri, about the issues to do with the native forests and the opportunities, exciting opportunities ahead. So um, please do visit our website. All right, well, let's get on with the show. Thank you for joining us. My name is Vincent Herringer. I'm your host for this evening. And um, in this episode, we'll be discussing the vital importance of native forests to New Zealand and the world, as we have been. Um, I'm the host of our Regenerative Future Season 2, Otato Nahiri, or our forest, and it's produced by Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust. And for these webisode, webisodes, we are very grateful for the collaboration of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, our wonderful uh, assistant, uh, Paula in Wellington. Over the years, over this year, Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust have taken a really deep dive into the regeneration of native forests as a source of natural, spiritual, and economic value. We've had a lot of momentum. We've had a lot of dialogue about the series online uh, and also on this uh, webisode series. Our ambition through these conversations, we hope to spark, spark some cross-sector dialogue and get people thinking about the potential of native forests in a regenerative and restorative economy. So welcome to episode three, how to grow a forest, creating new native forests through transitioning, planting and regenerating and into the future through sustainable forestry management. Uh, we're joined uh, by two absolute experts in the topic and we're very pleased to have Dr. Adam, Adam Forbes and Paul Quinlan, both of whom have contributed actually to um, uh, to the series and if you, you, you go to um, their uh, article, if you go to Pure advantage.org uh, you'll find those articles and I think Simon is putting the links to their articles directly onto the chat uh, so if you want to see what uh, Paul and Adam's uh, Adam have written uh, you can see them there all right so um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going um, I um, will let these guys introduce themselves, but we're happy to take your questions in the Q&A and please also keep an eye on the chat window because we'll be adding more information and links there. We're aiming to finish at 7.30, but uh, again, that doesn't mean you have to. There's lots of information on our website and you can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. And of course, we'll be here next Tuesday. And in a little bit of news, uh, if you haven't seen the movie that we made, uh, it's really worth a watch, absolutely gorgeous movie. And the good news is uh, even more people will be watching that because it's tonight live on TVNZ On Demand, uh, which means our audience numbers for that will really explode as people engage in that gorgeous movie about um, farmer uh, Ian Brennan from Waikato, who is uh, doing a great job planting native Nahiri on his land. All right. Um, uh, just one other um a uh, bit of feedback, um, housekeeping that is that uh, we, we are here every Tuesday and um, it, we'll be continuing with this. So we'd really like you to spread the news about uh, this webisode series and about the conversation we're having here about forests uh, and native forests in New Zealand. So um, please tell your friends, please email people the link. The link is the same every week uh, that you've already clicked on and that will get you to all the webisodes. All right. Well, so how to grow a forest, that is our challenge for the conversation tonight. And I'm joined by uh, Dr. Adam Forbes and also Paul Quinlan. So we're really chuffed to have you guys on the show. Thanks for joining us. And maybe, Paul, I could throw to you, um, introduce yourself. Who is Paul Quinlan? Well, thanks, Vincent. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Paul Quinlan, tāko ingoa. E noho ana ahau kei kaio, i te tai tokarau. So I'm um, Paul Quinlan, I'm a landscape architect and a trustee with Tane's Tree Trust. I convene the Northern Tōtara Working Group and I've been involved with the Tōtara Industry Pilot Project as well. And I'm a, a Northland uh, Regional Advisor for Trees That Count. 
So uh, pleased to be here tonight. Thanks, well, Vincent. Yeah, great. Thanks for joining us. Adam, how, how about you? What's your background and um, what do you love about native forests? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. What isn't there to love about native forests? Um, <laughs> There's not enough of them. That's what it's not it, I know. It's a big topic too. Um, yeah, so look, I work as a, a um, forest ecologist um, and I really these days specialise in native forest restoration and forest establishment. Um, done a bit of work over recent years around restoring clear fowls and um, had, was employed part-time by Te Dakao through the One Billion Trees program to travel around the country helping people establish native forests, which was a real privilege. So yeah, I've been doing quite a bit of work in forest restoration recently. Yeah. Just momentarily lost my Zoom, but um, I assume I'm still there. Great. Okay. Can't see myself, but you know, who cares? Um, <laughs> Adam, I'm, I'm really curious um, for um, to know, you know, last week we talked about where, where is the land going to come from? Uh, we, the, the Climate Change Commission has suggested that we uh, aim for 300,000 hectares of uh, new native forest in New Zealand. And the, the challenge with that, I suppose, is wh where is the land going to come from? And in fact, some people, even within Peer Advantage, are suggesting that maybe we could aim for a million hectares of new native forest. Uh, and I'm uh, so we talked about where would the land come from, um, but there's an additional challenge to this, Adam, which is, uh, you know, should it all be new land, as in I don't know, pastoral farm, uh, farmland, or or former exotic forest, or or indeed. Uh, should we be looking at growing what already exists? Uh, I wonder if you have a point of view on that topic. I certainly do. I mean, um, I think a mix of both, but there's really little point in establishing new forest if we aren't managing the forests we've got appropriately. And I guess a reality in much of New Zealand at the moment is that we've got some real pressing issues and threats for native forests. So, um, you know, I think that in terms of where that land would come from, I think it's about land use change um, at, to achieve it at that scale. And I mean, I've worked, I've been with landowners in this position. They're, they're sort of teetering, trying to make decisions about where to retire land, um, what it means for their business, um, whether they can make money from it. So I think that we need to be helping people at this time. Um, we, I don't think we can just expect 300,000 hectares of forest to be established. I think yeah. we're going to need to be pretty active with helping people, um, whether that's um, reverting um, um, forest or planting. And of course, a big part of this is looking after our existing forests and addressing those threats that they're facing. Well, you know, the you, you are uh, quite keen on seeing the, um, you know, seeing the whole existing uh, and regenerating um, nahiri grow. Can can you tell us about the opportunities that exist from, you know, kind of what all, already exists? Yeah, um, I mean, um, I think that in some parts of New Zealand, there are sub substantial opportunities, you know, where the climate's amenable to regeneration. Um, on hill country, where grazing pressure is pretty poor and where those pastures are, don't really contribute a lot. Mm. Um, you know, North Canterbury have been working there with um, over 30 farmers and, you know, southwest faces in that, um, in that landscape regenerate very well. And so, that's where I see that we've got major opportunities to do this at scale. And it, then it's about getting management right, getting advice right. So getting on top of threats um, in terms of, say, um, herbivory, um, really addressing that comprehensively so that forests can regenerate. Yeah. Um, other, other issues like enrichment planting, bringing back old growth species that are just simply functionally extinct from landscapes. Um, yeah, so, you know, I guess the... The theme of what I'm saying is um, it's about land use change. These are serious decisions for farmers or for landowners. You know, they're generally permanent decisions that they're making and they just need good support around them to make to make them comfortable that they're making the right decision. I don't I think if we don't do that, then people, many people will sit on the fence um, because they're just uncertain. And, you know, that's not a situation we want to be in. Yeah. Paul, you uh, travel around the country advising people on transition from one type of land into native forest. What are the kind of key issues that you are finding that they are struggling with? 
Oh, really good advice on um, on some of these land use choices and and what what is appropriate and and what's going to actually produce some sort of income, enable them to survive, and and yet at the same time do the things that they want to do in terms of the right thing by the land and the people of the future generations. But, mm. but mm. I'd like to just. Um, support what Adam said before there, I think um, it's, it's really important how we integrate more native forests into the landscape is it, it's it, it no longer appropriate just to be doing blanket land use, whether it's farming or forestry, or we need to be much more sophisticated and really integrate native forest in where it's appropriate. And that slogan, right tree, right place, is, is, is a very good slogan. And it is about appropriateness, site specific, and um, so, so is that kind of one of the key key challenges is identifying what's unique about your particular parcel of land and and figuring out what what is the right approach. Um, you know, is that kind of it's almost like custom customizing your own forest for your place. Yeah, I, I think that's a general principle that everyone will find that every bit of land is unique, has its own restraints and opportunities and challenges, and it's a, and the question of what's appropriate in terms of land use mm. is very site-specific, place-specific. So um, that's the key, and that's where people should start, um, rather than arbitrarily just um, enforcing a land use where it may or may not be appropriate. Yeah, okay. Um, we often hear about eco-sourcing. Can you explain that term and how important is that for making these kind of decisions when you're setting out uh, to either, um, you know, start a, uh, your own uh, native forest journey or or even uh, sort of regenerate what's already there? What Tell us about eco-sourcing. Well, that, that's a... Um... It's a principle that, that is largely adopted by... Trees that count, Tane's Tree Trust and many councils um, promote that. It, it's not without some debate about its merits, but it, essentially it's about keeping some of the, um, the local genetic variation and uniqueness intact and, and alive. So preserving that for the future. And um, if we're working with natural regeneration, that occurs anyway. And if we're planting, then we need to be careful about where we collect seed from and making sure that we are we're continuing to support the diversity the natural diversity mm. um, of the landscape you're big on working with what already exists so you're kind of hinting at that already and there there's a philosophy called near to nature forestry does that term capture what you're talking about and maybe you could expand on that a little near um, near natural forestry is um, otherwise often called close to um, it, um, oh, close to nature forestry. There's nature-based forestry. These are often terms that are a little bit interchangeable. They come under the umbrella of continuous cover forestry, uh -huh. which is it's more than just sustainability. It's about maintaining an, a more natural forest structure. Um, composition and uh, really trying to manage an eco a forest ecosystem, taking a more holistic approach to um, manage it in in that with an emphasis on the on the ecosystem. So timber may be a product of that, but there's a lot of other values that are being managed and integrated at the same time. It's um, it's a term that was really formalised. Um, Pro Silver in 1989 in Slovenia, but before that there was a working group uh, in Germany in the 1950s that were using that term, and it's had um, history before that as well. So it's it's often used um, various terms used around around the globe at present, but um, they they are really all about managing forests as a whole and as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adam, is that a term or a practice that has become relevant in your advice to landowners in New Zealand? Um, I haven't seen a huge interest in 
um, native forestry for timber uh, um, across the country, but certainly there, when I'm dealing with landowners and they're wanting um, native forest establishment, you know, generally they're looking for an authentic kind of a, you know, a naturalized forest system. Um, and, you know, like Paul's last point about eco-sourcing, that's a, that's a really good thing to be doing, to be using a locally adapted species and thinking about um, the forest succession that you're setting up mm -hmm. and how that will mm -hmm. perform at its early stage, but also in its later stages as well. So if you were uh, ap approached by landowners, what kind of questions, Adam, uh, are you asking them to consider before they um, start planting or before they start clearing uh, in, in anticipation of doing more planting? You know, what are the issues that you, uh, I guess, are finding out there? Um, well, there's a few things there. The one thing I really like people to consider is just to really sit down and think about what they're wanting from their forest. Um, it's just, to me, I can come and go on a site, but for me, it's important that people are heading in a direction they want to head in in terms of what they're going to do with the forest. Um, so that's something to really think about in advance. Um, the issues vary a little bit from, you know, different parts of the country. Um, there are some areas where, well, a lot of lowland New Zealand's sort of um, suffering from gradually increasing herbivore numbers, um, deer in particular. Um, which has been echoed in some recent research from the conservation estate where similar trends um, been come been brought to light over the last decade. Mm. So, you know, these are this is a really interesting and important topic for New Zealand because it's one that has social roots. You know, we can I don't think we can say that we just get rid of deer, we eradicate them everywhere because they're important animals to people and you know we can't polarize communities. So We've, as a nation, we've got some some really tough work ahead of us um, to really find a balance point for this issue, so that we can have healthy forests that are regenerating, and people can, you know, have that element in their lives as well. Mm. Um, so, so pests are a ma major issue to consider. What what other issues are um, are you coming up against? Uh, to you know that people really need advice about. Um, just fundamentally how to establish forest. It might sound funny, but depending on where you are in the country um, and the climate um, and the circumstances, you take a completely different approach. So, you know, if we we're on the Canterbury Plains, for instance, with 600 mils of rainfall per annum, we're going to have to be really active with establishing natives and, we, you know, we're going to have to be potentially watering, we're going to have to be um, we can't expect a lot of natural regeneration, so things are going to be very active, whereas if we were, you know, in Hill Country in North Canterbury or in Tairawhiti, um, we can, you know, we can expect more natural regeneration, which puts us in a completely different um, position. We can be more passive and we can tackle restoration at scale, just sort of thinking more about threats. So um, a large part of what I find myself doing is just simply resolving for the landowner what is the approach, you know, where, where do you put your money to, to be successful? Um, and, you know, once I think, I think of it of this sort of active to passive continuum, depending mm -hmm. on the regeneration mm -hmm. potential. Yeah. So it's about deciding where that property is on that continuum. And once you've established that, actually a few things fall into place. You have a good understanding what scale, according to their budget, you know, what scale we're talking about um, covering. And, um, you know, whether we are talking about planting at, at 1.5 metre centres or whether we're actually just talking about some enrichment planting as seed islands or some other sort of more passive approach. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a really important. And I think that's, there's a, there's a lot more need for that advice. Like, um, you know, it became apparent to me that how many forestry advisors are there in New Zealand that are giving advice on exotic forestry establishment? There's quite a few. They'll probably come to your property at no cost. Um, and then how many native forest advisors are there? There's very few around. It's sort of people have to call on their personal contacts or maybe call on someone from a university or something. So, you know, this 300,000 hectares, um, I just repeat again, probably needs some serious um, advice around it if we're going to be successful. Paul, you're, you're a busy guy. Where, where are you being called to and, and what kind of places are seeking out your advice? Well, I'm based up in the far north, but um, cover much of Northland and and beyond. But 
there's huge interest in planting native forest and and particularly on former pine forest land or harvested land where landowners are uh, would like to actually have some other options rather than just doing another rotation of pine or integrating some native forest into their um, their land and so What's the motivation, do you think, Paul? Is it uh, yeah? What what uh, is there a commercial element to, to what they're doing? Is there any commonality amongst y- your clients? Varies considerably. Um, some are purely ecologically driven. Others um, want to have some some commercial aspect, some productive potential there. That's quite common and. Um, that's the thing about native forests is that it provides such an array of values. It's it's that is their their feature, the the um the multiple values that they provide. So I think it'll always be a case of of the, the many benefits that come along with it. So from right from all the soil and water conservation values right through to landscape amenity values, but also some potential productive value. You know, that issue, well, not issue, but the opportunity that exists of once a exotic forest is harvested and you, you're more or less start, starting with a blank canvas, or at least it seems, you know, as someone speeding past in a car, it's a blank canvas. Obviously, it's it's not. There is there's soil and there are issues and there's climate and all the stuff to consider. Adam, what is the potential for transitioning from pine into native forest? And we know there are some companies and operators in New Zealand trying to do this at scale, right, who are um, moving, well, the promise is to move from uh, exotics into natives over time. And I believe that you've done quite a lot of science around this and research, at, at, at least made a start at it. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I completed a PhD on the topic and have been doing more research on the topic since. Um, I feel this is a this is a very important opportunity for New Zealand. It's it's one of um, you know I think for forestry we need a number of options and this is one option that we need to work on in some locations of New Zealand. So mm-hmm. you know it's it lends itself well to um, warm. Um, wet, wetter climates uh, where they occur around the country. Um, in areas where you don't have those conditions, you're going to have to be quite active if, on the active to get a passive continuum. You know, you're going to have to step in and make up for um, shortfalls that aren't occurring naturally. But you know, on for Can instance, I just um, just a really quick interruption on that uh, active side. You know, what kind of things are you including in active? Uh, obviously, you mentioned. Pest management, that's and that's always going to be an issue. What are what other kind of active considerations would there be? Um, well, because um, pine plantations, if we're talking about pine plantations, they're single-aged monocultures, so they're very homogenous. So yeah. opening up canopy gaps, mimicking that gap phase regeneration that occurs in natural forests is a really important one. We've done experimental work around that and we've got a good idea what size gaps and what shape gaps and how, how best to create them. Um, planting to overcome dispersal limitations, another quite crucial one in, in probably most of our landscapes where seed sources are um, pretty scarce or maybe mm-hmm. dispersers aren't quite doing the job. Um, or in climates where regeneration is just not very strong, at, um, planting would be more um, important there too. So in terms of rolling this out at scale, um, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think that where we're at at the moment is we need management scale trials. I think that's an, that's an appropriate scale to be doing this at. We, that is what we need. In fact, we certainly we need to be doing and learning. We've sort of done some science, but I think now's a time to be, you know, dedicating parts of land and parts of existing forest to this and and giving it a try. So I think trying to attempt this at you know thousands and thousands of hectares is not the right approach right now, mm-hmm. and it's also a long game. You know, for our forest species are pretty slow growing. Um, nothing happens in a hurry, so you know we need to set these up as trials and monitor them. And I guess that's another thing that bothers me a little bit about you know if um, this is being made into a business model and corporatized, as it were. 
um, are these people actually going to be around for decades to actually adaptively manage these forests um, if they're really doing it at that scale? It, it, it sounds incredibly attractive, Paul, the idea of, um, particularly in, in, in context of uh, climate mitigation, of, of taking uh, planting now in exotics to do it, the he some of the heavy lifting of carbon sequestration as we sort of move into this low emissions economy with a view to then moving into uh, longer term native nahiri. Uh, from your point of view, are you excited about that opportunity or do you share some of Adam's concerns, uh, you know, just about how realistic that is? I think um, I agree with Adam that it's, it certainly has merit. We need to take a slightly precautionary approach to some extent and just learn how how to do this. And um, this adaptive management approach is essential. We're going to have to be monitoring, learning, and it may require in some sites considerable active input, intervention. And that might be in the long term. That might be in 180, 100 years time. So I am concerned about any assumptions that it's a simple plant and leave type proposition. I don't think any land actually has that. We, it all, land always requires management and there's costs and responsibilities associated with that. And I hope that um, some of these uh, efforts at, at, or these ideas of just planting an exotic plantation and expecting it to transition naturally to native forest, I hope that there's sufficient budget there for mm. possible mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. active management that may be required to ensure that that does indeed occur. And, and the need, at present, I think um, the danger is that there's the short-term incentives are, are not there to encourage that sort of long-term appropriate management. Um, Paul, this could be quite a good question for you. There's a, a, a question here from uh, someone called Anonymous. Uh, they seem to crop up often in um, such debates, but um, uh, this is a question about the potential for fragmented native forest blocks that are kind of integrated sometimes in corridors or co-located, um, but still in a pastoral setting. The potential for these clumps effectively of native forest to work together to create an overall ecosystem. Is that a realistic expectation um, that you could, uh, I suppose, contribute to the, the overall um, biodiversity of New Zealand by taking this sort of piecemeal approach? I, I think there's definite um, benefits in having a, a matrix of native forest sort of woven through the landscape. Um, the pastoral landscape. I think David Norton's done some excellent research on that, showing um, how valuable that is to connect and to, to uh, between conservation state land and areas. Areas. I, I understand we simply don't have sufficient land and conservation um, a state to actually maintain all the biodiversity and things we require. We need to up the game between those conservation areas and therefore we do need to just weave it into to our production landscape as well. Mm. Mm. And yet so many of those um, places are kind of industri take an industrial approach to farming don't they where you know every scrap of land is devoted to particularly to dairy. Can you foresee a time there's a question here from Mel Whiting about the um, a time for instance when the Canterbury Plains might be pocketed with uh, native forest to um, work in association or alongside that sort of industrial scale theory? I think um, it's important to try and integrate it in for many um, for many reasons. I think the, the challenge is to how does, where are the incentives for the landowner to do so? And that's, if we envisage that, if, if that's what we have, as a goal, then we need to also make provide the um, the incentives to to enable that to happen. And I've no doubt that it's possible. Um, and so I, I think that it's simply we just need to um, 
engineer our cultural systems, our economic systems to be conducive to that. You know, we've talked in previous episodes about incentives and talked about the potential for uh, timber from native forests and there are obviously a number of barriers to those but Paul you've been part of a really interesting project in the far north to do with Totra. I wonder if you could tell us about the potential for uh, what, what that exercise has shown you about what could be harvested from native forest. Well, that, it's a, um, been a long-running project that's um, focused on the naturally regenerating tōtara in Northland, which is quite a phenomenon. It, it, it's um, maybe hard for people outside the region to really imagine, but tōtara comes up so prolifically that some landowners regard it as a weed. <laughs> it's relatively stock resistant, like manuka and, and kanuka and, and gorse, and comes up often in a grazed environment. And so as a consequence of land clearance and persistent farming activities and the presence of livestock through the regenerating scrub cover, um, we actually have extensive areas of, of native forest cover that are now predominantly, um, well, the tautara is the predominant canopy tree species within it. Mm. And some of those have regenerated on previously cleared land and now have millable sized trees. So it's um, it's an opportunity to integrate a native forest species and indeed native forest into that working landscape. We've, uh, we started the Northland Tools at a working group in 2005, Helen Moody from the New Zealand Land Care Trust and David Bergen um, from Tane Street Trust and Sion um, were, were key uh, instigators of that and since then we've run many um, funded projects mostly funded by the Sustainable Farming Fund looking at the potential to, to sustainably manage this for, mm -hmm. for not just timber production, sustainable timber production but also for the non-timber benefits that come along with it. Um, We've run silviculture trials, we've done wood testing, we've um, done a, a regional in inventory, sort of how much is out there, we've surveyed the use of the timber, and all of these projects have really come or returned encouraging results. And really we can say that it's, a, it's an excellent softwood timber with excellent potential for sustainable management, and it provides a really practical opportunity to actually get more native forest and in, particularly into pastoral um, landscapes. Paul, can you quantify the uh, price differential between mill potra and pine? Oh, that, that, it varies really. I mean, it's, we can, totara is a, is a fine native softwood species. Um, it, the young regenerating farm tautara often sells as, as um, kiln dried and finished timber for around $3,000 a cube or more. And the heart wood sells for considerably more than that, up, upwards of four and a half thousand for clear heart. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's not easy to compare. There's, it's a, there's a lot less volume associated with it. It's a sustainable, um, it's a sustainable timber. There's a lot of costs associated with it, and and really, the I think a key point is that the management of this, or the the impetus, or the why are we interested in trying to promote the sustainable management of this is not about timber. It's about all the benefits that come along with native forest. It's mm -hmm. about encouraging native forest as a land use, and um, timber is is like carbon or perhaps payment for ecosystem services. It's just some form of a vehicle to incentivize it as a land use. But it does indeed have to be one of the values, doesn't it, Adam? If we are serious about planting or regenerating and nurturing at scale, at least one of the motivations has to be the commercial return on timber. 
Yeah, I think that's a very real thing. I think um, attitudes or um, values differ widely among people, but for certainly for a sector of society, you know, when they're making land use decisions around native vegetation on their land, they really do want to know how, you know, what 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 the income streams are. And I think um, timber is a really important um, option. Um, so yeah, I do I do think it's a really important part of the mix. Mm. I'd like to comment on that, Vincent. The, I think it's it's one potential um, income stream that will be appropriate in some areas and not in others. And I think native forest is really requires multiple income streams. Timber is one potential, one, and um, carbon is another. Although a huge area of young regenerated native forest predates 1990 and is ineligible to, to be in the ETS. And, and the, the other thing is, you know, the landowners at present get no, there's no ability for them to realize any value from the, the ecosystem services or biodiversity values that the native forest and their land provide. Yeah. So between those three things, I think some forests, it will be a different, sort of a different weighting of, of any of those values. Some forests are native shrublands and they won't have much potential for carbon sequestration or timber, but they will have biodiversity value. Mm -hmm. And so all those different potential income streams, I think are, val are valuable and needed to, to incentivize native forest cover. Adam, there's a really great question here from Mark Dean about the role of riparian planting in um, uh, recovery efforts. Is that is that beyond mere compliance, or even even if it isn't, is riparian planting making a difference? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, is it making a difference? Look, I mean, I, I guess I'd come at, come at it from a different angle, and that is, you know, I know a little bit about stream ecosystems, and they evolved over a very long time under forest cover. Um, so the life in streams um, really is adapted to having canopy cover. So um, I, I guess it depends how, what you're going to measure and how you measure it as to whether you decide it's going to work. But I yeah. think... <laughs> Returning, What's the definition of success is what you're saying. Yeah, well, I think returning forest cover to streams is fundamentally the right thing to do. Yes. Um, I guess there might be some expectations of riparian systems and whether they're actually delivering on those. Um, you know, nitri I know they're not very, perhaps very good at addressing nitrogen issues. Um, so, yeah, I just think that, it, that returning forest cover to streams is fundamentally the right thing to be doing. Okay, well, let me be more specific then. Is, if the measure of success is increasing at at scale, the uh, amount of New Zealand native forest, is riparian planting making a difference? Um, I would think so. I think that if it's increasing native cover in our lowlands, um, then that's a step in the right direction, definitely. Um, you know, it's our lowland environments really that have been so heavily depleted of forest cover. And we know enough about the science to know that once you get below certain thresholds of cover, the, there's greater incremental loss of biodiversity. So if, if riparian forests are one um, avenue for returning forest cover to our lowlands, mm -hmm. um, I think it would be important in that respect. Paul mentioned earlier about the, uh, the, the, the uh, fact that, or the, the reality in the north of Totra coming back almost as a pest, as if it kind of has always been there. Is there a, um, uh, and I don't want to um, turn it into magic, but it, it, if left alone for long enough, will indeed native trees, native forest come back to, uh, I don't know, if you talk about, say, marginal land that is just that has been abandoned because it might have been too hard to farm or, or, or indeed, you know, was that the farm was unproductive? Is, is there, if left long enough would native forest return adam um it, it depends on some particular circumstances so if if you have the right climate okay and if you have really good local seed sources diverse old growth seed sources and if you have good populations of dispersers then you've got the basic ingredients for species to be 
returning naturally. Um, but um, I think in a, in a lot of areas of New Zealand, we're going to have to be a bit more active than that. And it's not just kind of a passive, completely passive approach. It's mm -hmm. about um, stepping in and just bridging those uh, natural shortcomings. Mm. There's a great question here, again, perhaps for you, um, Adam, that uh, from Bill Dyke, who's one of the contributors to uh, um, uh, the uh, Otata and Ahiri program. Where native trees are planted using nursery stock, there's might some concern about um, moving path pathogens such as uh, Phytophora um, from nurseries to the forest site. There is a new plant production biosecurity scheme that will reduce biosecurity risk, but it does not guarantee pathogen-free plants. Uh, this is a particular concern. Do you, is that a concern for you, Adam? And if, if it is, uh, what could be done about it? Um, it's a little bit outside my area of expertise, to be honest. Um, do you have any comments, Paul? Uh, yeah, colleague uh, Jackie Amers and Tane's Tree Trust and David Bergen have done a lot of work on this. And, and so I think Jackie's on a web, webisode next week. She'd be the ideal person to, to answer that. And so uh, it's certainly an issue that's on the radar, and um, but it's outside my area of, of knowledge. <laughs> um, is it something that um, could be, uh, you know, with, I'm not going to hold you to the science of this, but um, would eco-sourcing address some of those issues if, if the pathogens are being kind of introduced from other parts of the country? Does that make a case more for eco-sourcing? It, it's more about nursery hygiene because even with eco-sourcing, you may collect the seed from one area and have them grow in a commercial nursery somewhere else. Mm. So there's quite a few logistical issues there to address. Yeah. There's a really good question here from Rebecca Breen, who owns uh, 7,500 uh, square metres of established native books, bush in the Waitakere's. Uh, good for her. Um, and she's been doing lots of hand weeding and um, when not using any herbicides. She so sounds like she's putting really in the mahi. Well done, Rebecca. Um, but her question is, is there an organization that she could turn to for practical help with, um, you know, kind of doing some of that hard work? Uh, what's, and perhaps more broadly, the question is, what are you finding, you two um, chaps across New Zealand? Is there an, a growing network of supporters, of workers, of science, of intel um, ar around that could help people like Rebecca? Um, I guess what I've seen in different parts of the country, there's usually at least a, one or two ecologists, like a contractor kind of consulting ecologists that are available and they generally have an excellent local knowledge um, and usually a very good rapport with locals too. So that's kind of the go-to that I've seen as people employing a contractor to come in and, and deal with particular issues. Mm. How about you, Paul? There's some good information on the Tane Street Trust website and there'll be a lot of um, fact sheets and more information there that's free to download for people. There's organisations, the Trees That Count are able to fund some trees for planters and they apply. And of course, for larger scale planting, the Billion Trees was, was a great um, boost and, and assistance. It's only a subsidy. It's not a uh, it doesn't cover all the costs, but it, it still all helps. And there's a need to, to for people planting large areas of native forest to to get whatever assistance they can, because it is a an expensive, costly, um, long term commitment. So, it, I think really it, back to the, a, a key point is that there needs to be an awful lot more to help encourage and support uh, native forest planting mm. but not mm. just the planting also the management ongoing management um and i, I think yeah the ongoing management and also the the science and and research um adam you you were sort of hinting at the the uh before just just how much effort has gone into um you know exotics and and the forest industry but you you're seeing a, a real lack of knowledge around um the secrets of our native forest, is that right? Yeah, I do really see that. Um, I think it can be quite difficult for people to connect and get expert advice, particularly in an affordable manner. Um, and I see that if we're going to be really establishing native 
forest more than just planting natives, but thinking technically about how forest ecosystems are evolving and what their needs are. I think we actually need um, more of a, um, a base of students trained in this to, mm -hmm. to be coming mm -hmm. through. And this, you know, training is one thing, but we also need a career path for people because you know what it's like, you leave university and you, you actually want a stable job and you want to know that you can achieve some certain things. Um, so, you know, I think that this is, I see it as an emerging part of forestry and I purposely call it the forestry. Um, and I just think we need to gear up with training and, um, you know, funding um, careers and jobs and um, just really nurturing and growing our capacity in this space. Is there any particular a gap at the moment that uh, is more urgent than others? Um, well, I, there's a, there's a very big gap, I think is the point. Um, in every area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's no, well, there's very few obvious career paths down this topic of managing reversion, making decisions about native forest establishment, you know, um, and you know, you could perhaps working in a council and working along land, alongside landowners and restoration is one thing, but I think that there needs to be more than that. And there's almost um, private sector kind of niches, just like what I've been doing, lucky enough to be doing over the last couple of years to be mm. actually mm. have a contract to out, be out there helping people at the coalface and bringing science to, to their doorstep so that they you know, they can benefit from that directly. It was pretty interesting. In the very first episode, we had Sheridan Ashford, who is the co-president of uh, Future Foresters, is a young woman who... Uh, is not just excited about um, forestry in general, but it kind of excited about the potential of native forest, which is not something she'd been typically exposed to and finds herself really in, a, um, in an aging workforce, but full of opportunities. So from a career point of view, she was pretty excited about the potential for ongoing employment, lots of opportunities opening up as our um, aging foresters um, probably... Uh, what do you do when you're an aging forester, Simon? You, um, you, 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 you plant more trees. You plant more trees. Um, but yeah, so great opportunities there emerging for young people. And, and I was thinking also as you were talking, um, Adam, about the potential for technology, right? So you, you, we've talked about land use, we've talked about planting and, and talked about science, but here's a question from Callum Armstrong about the potential for technology in plantings. There are some great initiatives in the works of drone planting, um, for example, with more um, to, for efficiency sake. Um, do either of you see potential for um, the scale issue being addressed through technology? Maybe Paul, we could start with you. I'm happy to answer that, but I just on that last point, I'd, I'd just like to say this is a hellish exciting time for, for forestry in New Zealand. And I think we're really at, a, at an opportunity to really set a, a really important direction for the future. You know, this is about trying to find the solutions and the answers to address the climate change crisis and biodiversity crisis and freshwater issues. You know, this is, um, it's a fascinating little challenge. I've often referred to it as like the Rubik's Cube. It's, you know, you're, <laughs> you're trying to crack this and native forestry or native forests have such a role to, an essential role to play in this and so for any young people wanting to change the world or you know really find the answers this is a this is a great a great field to be um engaged with yeah fantastic. So, um, anyway that's on to this topic i, I think <laughs> technology Good uh, rave yeah sorry about that but technology is um we always need to have an open mind to that and be looking to see what the what the possibilities are and, and keep working on that but essentially we've got birds and nature doing things at scale that we couldn't hope to do and as and you know that that is the, the the key that we need to work with that big natural process and learn to just complement that plant strategically Put invest our efforts strategically to lever off that, and um, in some situations there may be technological breakthroughs that that assist. But um, there's 
you know, it's it, working with nature, learning how to do that is is going to is is the most important priority at present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Adam? Are you seeing uh, the involvement of technology and technologists in uh, in, in your work? Um, not so much, I have to say. Nothing really jumps to mind. I, I think one of the main areas that we need to be working on in a technological sense are the pest issues. Like I've just been working in Nelson, um, and the old man's bed issue is just horrendous. You know, there's really major problems there. Mm. And I'm just, you know, working with landowners, trying to help them through and coming up with plans and helping them prioritize where to put money. And I think if we could really make some inroads on these major pest issues for New Zealand, it's going to mean people can do more, at least forests will be more stable and um, it's just going to be a much better situation to be in. I, I do know um, the work of Grant Ryan with Project Cacophony. I don't know if you've come, come across that uh, uh, Christchurch technologist who um, was sick of possums um, eating his veggies. And um, he has uh, figured out that you can attract possums not just with um, smell, but with sound. And so is, is experimenting with using uh, the mating calls and the booming sounds of uh, of male possums to, or it could be female possums to attract the male possums. In any case, he's using sound as a bait, um, and then um, uh, effectively shooting them with his um, poison um, paintball gun, which I know sounds real science fiction, but it's kind of the point, really. You know that the technologists bring a different kind of perspective into this task. Yeah, I can imagine, and I think it'll probably be the things that none of us are thinking right now that are really the breakthroughs um, in the future. But mm. yeah, it's interesting to hear. Yeah. All right. Um, look, we are um, uh, got a couple more questions here, which I, I really um, I think are very interesting. Um, Mike Faro has asked, can biochar be used to increase the carbon sequestration potential of forests? Um, who knows about biochar? Paul, is that for you? Unfortunately, I don't really know enough about it to answer that question. I'm I've heard about it and I, I think there is on a small scale, I think it's often used in the permaculture um, sort of scale, but mm. I don't know about forestry situations for that. So I, I, I can't answer that. How about you, Adam? What do you uh, know about biochar? Sorry, I wish I could help, but I really am not okay. the right person. Frank Street in the chat knows a lot about Okay, Frank in the chat knows a lot about biochar. Okay, all right. Well, we're going to. Um, We'll refer people to the chat for that one. Thanks for the question, Mike. Um, there's also the question, I suppose, of, um, you know, what could you do as your as a private citizen? Whether, you know, the, we've been talking really about planting at scale, if you're a forester or if you're a, a, a landowner of, of, at scale. Um, Paul, what about us as, as just plain old citizens? Um, what would you like to see being done at a kind of citizen level and maybe even just at a, at a householder level? What, what message would you have for those people, for us? <laughs> well, that's a big one. Where do you start? I mean, there's um, like to see all of our efforts and um, from going plastic free and reducing our footprint on the, on the planet in, in all sorts of ways, but in, Terms of native forest, I think we we need to support uh, initiatives that are going to encourage more native native forest cover, and that might be, um, to, for instance, opening the mine to a native timber industry and supporting the, the purchase of native timber in order to support that as a land use um, option for landowners instead of importing. Um, a huge amount of timber. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think just finding ways where we can actually support the the land uses that that are that we need to um, have and and the, the improvements and the enhancements. We use our consumer dollar and choice, and and um, every little individual's efforts will mount up and to a significant cumulative effect. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, good. How about you, Adam? What what would you like to see happening at a at a kind of citizen level? Um, look, I mean, what comes to mind is personally we converted our front lawn into an area of native plantings. Um, we put a bird bath in, and the life that has come through that area since doing that is just really quite amazing. You know, the silver eyes, the fantails, the tui, the tui come and swim in the bird bath. Um, the kereru was feeding on the relatively young um, um, cabbage tree fruit that we're growing. It's just amazing. So I think that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of of a view that the right tree, um, I was going to say in the right place, but I'm going <laughs> to, the right tree um, can really make a difference. You know, there could be functional benefits just from having one fruiting or flowering tree for that time it's doing it that can be a real magnet for biodiversity so if you can just sort of increase the habitat quality of your land in some way I think you know that's going to help and if we look at the national policy statement for biodiversity or you know the, the draft one that's being um, talked about yes hold it on um, there's kind of requirements in there to get native cover above 10 percent in urban areas so that's going to require everyone to do their bit, really. Um, it's not like the council can just wave a magic wand. So, yeah, yeah I mm -hmm. think that's all heading in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting perspective, isn't it? That, you know, maybe the best thing we could do is um, uh, advocate and in our own backyards mm -hmm. take uh, native trees seriously, native forests seriously. It's been really disturbing to me just in my own neighbourhood um, just how many big trees are being cut down and in fact I think last week someone um, used the, the term um, shrub division uh, which you know just was so disappointing in a, in a leafy old Auckland suburb where I live just to see so many big trees being cut down so even at that level you know I think it counts doesn't it? It does it all adds up and you know even the exotic trees often they all you know, they add structural diversity and so on. It all comes together. We live in a reasonably, in a more mature kind of, a, you know, an older um, neighbourhood where there's quite a few trees of all people have planted all sorts of stuff over the years. And um, we've had kiriru nesting down the back and um, the tui are amazing. So, yeah, I'm just quite optimistic about if we can all put something back and um, just do our best. I think it, it adds up. Yeah. Look, as a topic, I think urban uh, afforestation is such a great topic and we will be addressing some of that in next week's episode because um, we're looking at the many benefits of native forest outside of timber. So the non-timber benefits and we're joined by the amazing Dr. Jackie Amos, who I think has been joining in the chat, hasn't she, Simon? Yeah. Um, and Jackie has been a great contributor to this project also. Um, is in the film, uh, and also by Eden Walker and Hal Davies. So, you know, we're really excited about um, the potential for urban contribution to our Nahiri. Uh, obviously not at scale, but um, perhaps doing some of those um, uh, the little pockets, Paul um, and Adam, that you talked about. So we're out of time. Uh, we have kept uh, going because it's such an interesting topic. So I'd just like to thank our audience for joining us again to talk about uh, Nahiri about our exciting future in this beautiful country, but also to Paul Quinlan and to um, Dr. Adam Forbes for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Great yeah. stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And, and um, we will be um, we will be uh, here again next Tuesday, same time, talking about uh, a similar topic, but a fresh angle, um, talking with those people I just talked about. So um, have a good evening and uh, let's get planting. <laughs>